It is crazy. Be retiring with a pension. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinet's Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinet. The Jason Cabinet's Experience is brought to you by Cabinet's HR. At Cabinet's HR, we deliver HR companies with 400 or fewer people with an HR platform and also providing you with a dedicated HR business partner. Our guest today is Andy Lopez. Andy, are you ready to be great today? I'm ready to be fantastically great today. Andy Lopez is the Vice President of Business Development for GoodTrust.com. GoodTrust is a website dedicated to preserving and securing your digital assets and financial planning. Andy chairs various committees in both professional and nonprofit sectors and is passionate about leveraging, leveraging tech in order to help veterans access much needed resources and employment opportunities. Andy, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me. So Andy, what do you focus on right now? So right now it's business development uh, with goodtrust.com. What that means is um, we're a brand new platform. Uh, we've been around for a little bit over two years. Um, and we're aggressively growing. Um, matter of fact, just this past week um, on New Year's, CBS just ran another story featuring Good Trust and talking about what it does as, as a digital platform and preserving your digital legacy. Uh, so my focus today and for the next, next year is business development and finding partnerships for goodtrust.com. So Andy, you know, of course I did my research with my guests. Somewhere I found a quote you said where I believe it was Life and legacy is what you make it. What does that mean to you? Well, um, your life and your legacy, right? They're, they're tied together. Uh, how you live your life, the things you do, even, even the problems and mistakes you make, uh, carve a path forward. But your legacy is what you leave behind, no matter what the mistakes were. If, if it's positive, it's good. Um, it's what you make of it, right? If the story remains to be told. It's up to you to finish it. So how important is legacy to, legacy to you? Oh, um, I, I was in the funeral profession since, gosh, I was a kid when I first started in the funeral profession. And I've watched people always wonder um, what that life meant. Uh, it's a sign of a life well lived. It's always been important to me because you ever look at a headstone and you see the birth date and the death date. I figured your legacy is that, that thing that fills that line between your birth date and your death date. So to me, a legacy is very important because it's, it's really what your future children, grandchildren will remember about you. I can't imagine how many people like had regrets, like going through the funeral process, like people saying like, you know, my grandfather had regrets, my father had regrets. I bet have you like, not the negative parts, like some, like we you open your eyes to different things, right? Oh, absolutely. Um, and watching, watching the process throughout all those years, uh, having been in multiple scenarios, um, you, you never hear someone actually say, I wish I had more money. They say, I wish I would have had more time. Uh, which is um, when, when you look at what your legacy is, it, it's not about things, it's about memories. Yeah, I always say the same thing. You can't buy back time. And then but then you got to balance. Where you can't you know, continue all the time like having fun. You got to pay the bills and stuff like that, right? It's, it's, a, it's a hard compromise, I think. Yeah, it's, a, it's a big piece of balancing and staying diligent with what you have to do in order to accomplish what your wishes are. So Andy, you, to my opinion, you do a great job of giving back. You give back to many organizations, but someone will highlight is like there's one called, I think, Save the Brave, the Son M. Walsh K-9 Memorial Foundation, and the Wine Country, is it Wine Country Marines? Yes. And that's only a few of the many you give back to. You own many boards, many things you give back. Can you talk about some of that? Why is that important to you? Well, um, when I served in the Marine Corps, um, I got hurt, came home, and everyone else stayed in, and they finished their tours and did everything they had to do. And I always joke, I've done more for the military out of the military than when I was in the military. Um, it, it's my, my way of coping with not having finished. Um, some people call it survivor's guilt. I call it uh, the way I feel like my legacy will be read when I'm gone. Uh, with Wine Country Marines, we've, we've done so much for so many of the fire victims in Sonoma and Napa. So many of these wounded warriors that didn't have wheelchairs, that didn't have access to supplies or much needed help. Sometimes it's just financial support. We just had um, recently had a Marine Corps veteran uh, who lost his house that was also attached to his business, who was also attached to the trailer that he was living in with his family while he was building the house. And in the blink of an eye, we were able to give him everything he needed in order for him to move forward with his family. And that, that's what it's all about. And you think, how about, how about this? Um, I ask this question sometimes on a podcast. 
there's like, in my opinion, there's almost too many nonprofit veterans, right? I mean, just like, I'll make this number up, like 20,000, and it's probably more than that. As a person who wants to give back to veteran organizations, how do they make sure they give back the right nonprofit, right? Because some are doing a good job. Some, it seems like they're just there for the tax, they're not like the tax write-off, right? Or to like, get it paid, right? How has, if someone wants to give to a non veteran nonprofit, what steps should they take to make sure the money's going to the right place? Is actually, not, and they're doing the right thing. You know, I am glad you asked that question because before I get involved with any nonprofit, one of the things I, I do is I want to know financials and I want to know who's making money, if anyone. Uh, for example, there's a couple of websites actually out there that you can literally Google a, a nonprofit and look at their rating. And if they have a low rating, that tells you that two thirds or more of the money is actually going to the pockets of people. So how, how do you do this? Like, I'm pretty sure Eastern nonprofits if they could, they would have you working 40 hours, free time, volunteer time, right? <laughs> How do you like put boundaries up to protect your time, even though this is important causes that you do? Uh, I'll give you an example with Save the Brave. Save the Brave, we just had our, our big meeting uh, that we had down in, in California, and I was unable to make it. Um, there, there's no pressure there. What, we do what we can with what we have because we're not paid. Uh, we're all volunteers. We all, uh, for example, Wine Country Marines, I pay dues every year as a board member. Uh, the Marine Corps birthday ball, which is a big fundraiser. I buy my ticket. We get nothing for free. Uh, almost every dollar that comes in, I think, I believe the last number we had was 98% of all the dollars go back out. Sean's canines. Sean was killed in action. He was in the army. He was a diehard kid that loved police dogs and he wanted to be a, a handler. So we started Sean's canines. And every dollar that comes into Sean's canines goes back out to do nothing but support the canine departments and buy canine uh, officers for the different departments. So as a, when you were in the funeral profession, did you sell for them also? Uh, in, in the funeral profession, yeah. yes, yes. So what, what made you get a career in sales? Like we said in the pre-talk, most 10 year old boys don't say I won't be a salesperson, right? What brought that on? Why that uh, career? Well, um, I actually do, do a presentation on this because I learned how to speak English when I was 13 years old. I moved to Florida from Puerto Rico. My first job was this kid Angel told me, hey, come with me. And the setup, listen to this, there was a white van in the back of my middle school, this big white guy sitting there saying, come on, kids, get in. We all get in the van. The only thing missing was the free candy sign on the side. We jumped in and we went door to door selling candy and I learned a script. And I sold more candy than all those other kids because I didn't understand the words, no, I can't. That's, that's, that's a great story. No, nowadays, you could never do that these days. <laughs> no, as soon as I had a van in front of school, all kind of FBI <laughs> SWAT teams be there, you know? Yes. So what do you enjoy about sales? You know, the conversation piece, the, the people factor, right? Um, selling, if you're just selling, then you're just telling. You're not building a relationship. Uh, Six Ziglar said a quote a long time ago. He says, people like you, they'll find a way to buy from you. But if people trust you, they want to have a relationship with you. And it's about building trust, having relationships, and really not just having a one-stop sale, but a sale that leads to the next sale. Because the only good sale is the one that leads to the next one. That means they trusted you and gave you a referral. So I know a lot of people like we're both involved in tech side, sort of kind of saying a lot of product demos, the salespeople are doing like, they're, they're doing like features. This does this instead of like showing how the product can actually solve the problem, right? Right, right. So you have to establish the problem when you're talking to people. And you think about the audience today versus 20 years ago, baby boomers are pragmatic, but now we have an audience that it, the problem has to be identified. It has to be clear, crisp and concise and really, really solve what you're talking about solving, not just something that's vague because you'll lose your audience immediately. So once you do a presentation, it's always followed by a statement of intent. Okay, what's our next step? Set, set the next step, you'll always have success. At least you get a no for an answer rather than a maybe. Yeah, that's so important, right? Everyone, everyone, everyone you gotta hear a no, right? Cause you hear maybe, or I'll get back to you. I mean, the resource you waste going back and forth and like following up, you know, the no is the best thing in sales, I think. So is your approach to sales based, different based on generation? Like do you sell differently to boomers, to generation X, to millennials, or is it all based on the same approach that y'all use? Uh, you know, any, any smart business development person, salesperson, whatever you want to call it, um, you adapt the message to fit the audience. Uh, you have to understand who you're talking to and what's important to them and whether or not they want to do all the talking or they want you to do all the talking. Ultimately, like for example, with Good Trust, um, it's, a, it's a digital platform. Not everyone that I'm presenting to is technically savvy. So I have to sometimes break it down using the KISS method, keep it simple and stupid. And sometimes I have people that are asking high level questions, which 
tend to lead to a different conversation. And those are usually easier implementations when we actually partner with someone because they get it. Sometimes it takes a, it's a slower approach, but ultimately when someone understands what you're trying to get them to see, then it makes sense. The aha moment clicks and you move forward. Now in the past, you've had people work for your sales, right? Yes. When you, when you hire salespeople, what kind of characteristics do you look for? Oh, wow. Attitude is everything. Um, I can tell you one of my biggest success stories, uh, there was this young lady that no one believed that she could do it. Um, they said, she's not a salesperson. She's not, she doesn't have the attitude and the character. Well, she came in humble, quiet, smile. And she told me she wanted to make $65,000 a year. That was a big number for her. And I remember looking at her and saying, if you make $65,000 a year, you won't have a job. You need to make more. And overnight, this woman went from making $30,000 working at a, a grocery store to making over $100,000 just by applying simple principles and she had no bad habits. Think about sales, and correct me if I'm wrong, but sales is probably one of the own professional where, where you can determine how much money you make. The more calls you make, the more, you know, the more leads you get, the more, more things you close, the more money you make, right? Absolutely. And in today's world, it's not like the old days. In the old days, a shark got all the sales. People smell that now. Talking about like Wolf of Wall Street oh, type yes, things. Yes, technology has changed everything. So you must be honest. You must be deliberate. You must also be transparent in your presentation. Uh, if you're hiding anything from your customer, they'll smell it, they'll figure it out, and you'll lose credibility. And they probably know before you even told them to lie what the truth is, right? Absolutely. Yes. So what's your view on this? Like I've heard some people say sales are only commission only, salary only, or a combination. What's your, what's your take on that? You know, uh, commission only positions tend to yield more dollars if you are successful, if you have the right habits, if you have the disciplines that are required in order to have that cadence of personal accountability that leads to success. If you are good at talking on the phones and closing deals, but you're not that confident in your abilities yet, going full commission is not always the way, but it will, it's baptism by fire, right? If you have a salary and commission, what happens is that commission can become 60% of your salary or 10% of your salary. It depends how hungry you are. Les Brown likes to say, you got to be hungry <laughs> because if you're not, you're only going to live on that salary. That salary should just barely pay your bills because your commissions should determine your success. Andy, is sales sales like, is it sales the same for refrigerators, for cars, for SaaS? Is it sales sales? You have to change the process up. Well, I have children. Um, you have children. You remember trying to convince your child to either learn how to tie their shoes or not to do something. You convince them and you're constantly talking to them or a child that wants something at the grocery store that says, I want a lollipop. And in five minutes, you see them getting yelled at by mom and then they're your checkout and they have the lollipop in their hand and they're smiling. They don't hear no. That's what sales is. Children can sell. Conversation is sales. Pitching and saying, if I could, you would you, that's dead. So, you know, there's a lot of salespeople out there, a lot of great salespeople, a lot of processes out there, template stuff to do. But I think the challenge for a lot of people is just to pick up the phone or send the email, right? I mean, you have all the resources there, scripts, stuff what to do. You, 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 you don't mind, you know, like you're going to be told no a hundred times. It's the one yes that goes forward. But so many people, especially small business owners, like they hesitate to pick the phone or call or email or take the first step. Why, why do so many people have that, have that, don't want to make that jump, so to speak? Oh, that's a fear of rejection. The fear of rejection. When we are calling uh, non for profits, for example, if I'm calling to ask for donations at uh, the Wild World of Sales Conference, when I was the co chair for the sales conference in, in Vegas, I had to call every single business owner that I knew and ask them to sponsor or donate. And m nothing more terrifying than calling your friends to ask them for money, right? Um, and that's it, the worst, right? Calling your, kind of calling your friends or close or family, that's the worst, right? Yes, but at least I always say, if you get a no, at least you have an answer. Um, the fear of offending people is what keeps business owners from making those phone calls. And if you have a product and a service and you don't offer it to your close friends, family, or the neighborhood that you support or the community you support, and they find it somewhere else and they do not get the services they were supposed to, it's shame on you because you should have been first. In today's world with the internet, and everything else that's available, the key is to be first. So make that phone call, send that email, don't hesitate, and at least you reached out. I think I think Mark Cuban said sales cures all or something like that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, sales cures all ills. <laughs> what, what's your take on cold calling? Some people say it's dead, some people say you just need to do it. What's your take on cold calling? You know, in, 
today's technology prevents a lot of spam from happening. Um, when you stay in hotels as much as I do, towards the end of the year, I'm getting all the phone calls that are spam from uh, timeshare companies. And you know, if you answer the phone and, and you get they get you on the phone, they're going to keep you on the phone. But if your business is a business to consumer, it's a, it's a relational business that requires some conversation, that cold call can actually yield some results. But if you're selling something that's not tangible like that, um, I don't see how a cold call will yield the same result that a campaign on digital marketing mm -hmm. or social media would do. Um, because if you have a campaign that is actually designed to have content that creates that engagement, then you're going to have better success than if I make a hundred phone calls. Yeah. I know some of these marketers are pretty good, right? And this is probably just coincidence, but a few years ago, my daughter, she lives in Arlington, Texas. She told me, Hey, you know, I'm getting a new, I'm, I'm getting a new phone number. I'll give you a call for like, you know, a couple of days. Right. So a couple of days I got a call from Arlington area code. It was a marketer, right? So it had to be a coincidence, right? Like, how do you, how do you know I was going to answer the phone? You know, you don't answer your phone. You don't know the number, right? Well, they're, they're ghosting numbers too now. Um, I, I have a Missouri number and I get phone calls from Missouri all the time. And mo most of the time I answer, there's someone in another country trying to sell me a trinket or a web page or web design. I get a lot of web design um, phone calls and SEL phone calls because that's, they, they see I have a business, they have a, I have a website. So that, that's what they want to do. Yeah, I still have a South Carolina number. I get numbers, calls at all the time, you know, 6 a.m. my time, 9 a.m. their time, right? It's always a marketer. So I stopped answering them. So who are some salespeople that you follow? Oh, wow. Um, you know, when I, when I use the term sales, um, I, I like inspirational folks. Uh, of course, you have the, the sales shark. I mean, he is, um, he, he is, he's a beast. Uh, but you have Simon Sinek, who, who really makes you think really hard. And when you're talking about empathy and sympathy in the profession that I've been in, um, you know, Renee Brown, it's someone I listen to because it puts me in a mindset to understand what I'm going to talk about and prepare me. Um, as sales is concerned, um, there's an inspirational guy that I listen to. They call him the hip hop preacher, Eric Thomas. I love I know, Eric I know Thomas. Him. ET. Yeah, I know him. Yeah, I follow him. Yeah. Yeah. He 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 speaks to my soul in many yeah. ways. Of course, Les Brown. He's one of the classics and Six Ziglar. Anything he's ever written, um, I love to read because he he is good. Grant Cardone, believe it or not, if, if you subscribe to his channel, you're gonna get a lot of spam, but he has great content. He does. Yeah, he does. So. What's your take on, like, um, when you think about a sale, you, you sell yourself all the time, right? Even if you're not in sales, right? Like, if you're, you know, going for a job, you're selling yourself. If you're part of a product market team, you're trying to sell the CEO on a new product, right? Talk about the points of everyone being a salesperson. Well, it, that's the relational piece of sales, right? Um, and understanding that, get an answer. Have intent. Um, and a statement of intent is what you do. For example, um, if I want to go to, to dinner, uh, the quality of the question will always determine the quality of the answer. If I ask my wife, what do you want to have for dinner? And she tells me she wants to have Thai and I don't feel like having Thai. Well, it's on me. I asked the wrong question. I got the wrong answer. Instead of having a leading question that gets me to where I need to go. You do this every day as a human being. So when someone tells me they're not in sales and you work in a business, Every single person from the person who cleans the floors to the person to answer the phone to the person who's the CEO, they're all salespeople because you're carrying the brand on your shoulder. So you should always be mindful that everything you do is a reflection on the business. Andy, let's talk follow-up. Like some people will say, you know, follow up three or four times. You know, there's a, of course, there's a final line between spam and a follow-up. From your point of view, how often do you follow up with a, with a company or, or a potential customer? Wow. Um, that's a that's a very interesting question because in different areas of business, it applies to, in my in, at least in my opinion it applies differently because I've been in different types. Um, there's there's a saying call until the buyer die because they're always going to need it. If you're if you're trying to protect someone from the inevitable like prearranging their funeral, I, I would say you call them until they tell you they already took care of it. Why? Because if they don't take care of it then their family's going to suffer at the end. You're, it's the biggest gift of love you can give someone, which is protecting. That's why good trust, for example, when I have people trying to get them to actually use the platform, why? Because that's, that's not a very important decision. However, a car, um, a pair of shoes, uh, a, a trinket, calling people over and over again after the third or fourth call, then you're just wasting time. However, uh, the only uh, the, the only bad lead is is the one that you actually stop calling because there's never a bad lead, just bad timing. So 
a lot of people that you reach out to whether you're marketing or doing sales stuff, they'll come back and say, this is spam. Stop doing spam, right? Right. What's the definition of spam? Because like some people was like, for so example, I did a crowdfunder like earlier this year or earlier last year. I sent someone a message on Sales Navigator. This person came, he's one of my connects on LinkedIn. He said, hey, why are you doing this as spam? I'm like, this is Sales Navigator. How's it spam, right? So there's so many definitions out there. What's your definition of spam? I, I think that's, that's a term that's overused. Um, even in LinkedIn, for example, people get offended if someone reaches out to you and says, hey, um, this is what I do. If you have an interest, let me know. But what's the purpose of LinkedIn if it's not to make connections to grow your business and, and your network, right? Um, when it comes to spam, I'll give you an example. I, I wrote a blog for the VA where we offer good trust to every single veteran uh, for free. This is a, a, I remember, a, I remember saying a that. year free. Yeah. And if you start reading the comments, I got roasted by guys who were just so angry. They're like, oh, this is spam. This is a bait and switch. It's a free will that you can get for free. You don't have to put in a credit. You don't even have to do anything other than create the will and download it. If you want to use good trust, use it. If not, pass on it. But people think anything nowadays is spam. Um, I think spam is when a robot or someone from a third country is paid to just send a thousand emails an hour about the same product just because you clicked on something on Amazon and you don't want it. But, you know, that's that's today's world. That's cold calling today. That's the same thing. Yeah. My definition of spam is this, like someone will reach out to you on LinkedIn, right? You, you accept it, right? And then seconds later, they send you like this two page, you know, why they should like buy your, like why you should do something for you. Like example, one company from India will want to do like my software development for me. You know, I replied, hey, thanks for this. You know, I already have my internal team. Well, and he re actually replied, I know you have your team, but I'm sure we can do it better than them, right? It's, it, it's, it's so like funny. <laughs> that happens to me often when I get those LinkedIn messages and you accept a, a connection and then you get the automated. And there's programs out there that are yeah. doing this today. Yeah. Uh, I'm guilty of it. I've, I've used some of those programs to reach out to contacts that I didn't have to just say, hey, uh, for business development purposes. But if you adapt the message to be soft, to be direct, but not be salesy and not be pushy, just an open invitation. If it looks like something you want to do, I would love to have conversation. That's, I think, more tactful than, hey, I have an opportunity to get this for you. Why don't you give us a call? Let's set an appointment. Here's my calendar. That's a lot. Yeah, I know some people like, I know LinkedIn is like their anti-automation platform. They have all the bots that are shut it down. But I think automation can be good on LinkedIn, right? Because, like, example, if you're trying to sell, like I have a lot of followers on LinkedIn, do I have the time to send an interview message to all people trying to sell them stuff? I can't do it, right? It's, right. it's impossible. So I mean, how do you reach out to all these people without using automation? And then, of course, now I could be wrong. I think LinkedIn is set up where you only send out 100 messages per week regardless, right? And one thing in my, like, I have a love-hate relationship with, with LinkedIn. It seems like, you know, it doesn't matter if you're, like, on, on the free version, the premium, or the sales navigator. It's all the same stuff, right? 100 messages, right? Which you think you have sales navigator to open up more stuff for you, right? So it's yeah. kind of frustrating. I haven't seen a, a, a huge difference between the, the, the different um, levels because uh, I've had them all. And it, it's, it's interesting because we have friends who use LinkedIn as a platform to just blast their message to everyone using those, those programs. But these are the same friends that say they would never do multi-level marketing. I'm like, it's, this is the same setup, right? You're just calling everyone you know and trying to get them to say yes. It, it, you know, if it's, they're successful, good for them but um I, I just i like to go about it a different way so are, are there any other platforms you use besides linkedin for your sales oh uh, you know it, there there's a couple of things that you can do um for sales and when you're sending uh, for example a lot of emails stuff like SendGrid mm -hmm. always works really well um your crm platforms are always very good to utilize to actually do the sales management piece of it uh sales enablement tools really do make it easier for you to sell um rather than just being direct on LinkedIn, because you're the problem with LinkedIn is you can end up with the C-suite level folks that are looking at that. They have never made that decision for their company because they're in a level that they'll never even look at that. So it's not even, it doesn't even relate to them. So you're going down a rabbit hole that you don't really need to go in and you're wasting email. So Andy, talk about this. It's going to be like a multi-layered question and answer. So there's sales, there's marketing, business development, revenue, like all the same things. They tie together. Like what's like, so build marketing for sales. If chief revenue officer actually a, a thing right now, or it's like, how's it all play together? I think they're, they're all different titles and uh, there's a big umbrella, right? I think it all falls under the sales umbrella. Um, when we use the term sales, that's a very general term um, that has everything to do with relation and he, the human factor. Um, when you have business development, 
that person is actually there to build the business and grow its connections with other businesses, not just sell the product. And then, of course, you have the revenue uh, piece, which it's it's someone that's there to maximize the potential of the customer and the and the customer experience by leveraging that and creating generating more revenue. However, I mean, when you look at all of them, that we're all in sales. We're all in sales. We're just our, we're the evangelists of the company. So you know, a lot of startup founders they start a company. They're mainly like, like technical. They build a product. They probably do a hardware job, marketing themselves, personal branding. And when time to sales, they think I'll just put my product out there and some people will come. Because of course, that's not true. And of course, there are a lot of a lot of you know, tech people are kind of introverted. They don't want to do sales. What advice you have for founders to do sales? Because you know, of course, they really can't afford a person like you. You know, and I remember when we were some like, if you're a founder, you should do the first ten thousand dollars per month yourself, right? But if you're not comfortable, like, should you really like do an internal hire, like outsource it? Like, what's your advice on that? You know, I'm not a fan of outsourcing. Um, I believe that no one tells your story better than you. I'll give you an example. Ricard Steiberg, our CEO. Ricard ran a, a big piece of business for Google. He actually ran the marketing for Google in the U.S. and Asia. And he's a, he, he himself likes to tell you, I'm kind of shy and do not like sales. But he's one of the best salespeople I, that we have because he tells a compelling story. And he always asks questions that lead to an answer, usually the answer he's looking for. So don't be shy as a, as, a, as a business owner, ask questions, evangelize your product and get those people out there to wave the flag for you because your customers will sell your product better than you will ever sell it as long as they have success using it. So don't be shy. Can you talk about the points that are qualifying your customer? Like for example, me, I do a traffic company for another few people. You'd be wasting my time to reach out to come with 500 people, right? Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of people like do the, like what's called the throw on the wall thing. Talk about the points of qualifying your customers and not wasting your, you or the person's time. Well, that's, that's understanding your business model. Uh, you need to first understand what your business model and your ability to scale up or scale down is. Because if you bite off more than you can chew, then you're going to overcommit it and underdeliver and then destroy your brand completely. So be mindful that you don't always have to hunt elephants. Sometimes you just want to find yourself four or five good rabbits that run far, hard, hard and fast that you can actually feed and actually work with and do a stellar job and then scale up to the next level. Often businesses start out and they want to be the king of their space tomorrow and fall really hard because they were going too fast, too hard without understanding that you have to have a foundation as a business to understand how you're going to serve that customer. So not everything is everything for everyone. So don't try to be that. Um, that's my message. Don't be everything to everyone. Just be you, be true to your brand and know when to tell, to tell the customer that we're not friends anymore. We can't do business anymore. So follow up question. Talk about the importance of getting rid of bad customers. I think so many people, especially new business owners, like I have these two customers. They're like, I think I'm a 9% of the time. I need to let them go. If I let them go, the revenue leaves, right? In my opinion, you're wasting so much time on those like bad customers, right? As soon as you get rid of them, you can actually be successful. It's interesting. Um, I've been in that position before. And currently I have a, a very close person that, that a good friend in their marketing and they have this, this one customer is pretty large, but at, when they net out the dollars, they're maybe breaking even or losing money on this customer and they're developed. They, they spend so much time focused on this one customer with all of the other ones needs, need support and help. Uh, you have to be mindful of that. And you have to have the, I guess the backbone to say, this is not working out. Um, I apologize, but either we have to scale back and this is what we're going to do. Set boundaries. Do not allow yourself to stretch yourself to the place where you're sacrificing the rest of your business or your team because you're focused on this one customer that you hope will one day yield something else. Um, give it a try, but don't, 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 I guess don't bite your nose off, bite your face, right? Yeah, I think it's important too to ask, right? I have a good friend, Matt Boyer. He had a, a, a tech consulting company. He spent all this time with one customer. He finally went to him, hey, like basically, he said better than this, but he basically laid out, hey, you're killing, you're killing us right now. You do, you're doing this experience, you make a lot of money, but it's, it's, it's killing me, right? And they, oh, we didn't realize that. Let's rework our contract, right? And then we reworked it. So sometimes you just have to tell them that you're getting killed and like, we work it for you. That, that is true. And I mean, I've seen that happen too. When you approach your customer and they love you, they want to keep doing business with you. Like, hey, don't leave me. Let's see what you can do. And what, just focus on what you do best. And don't try to scale up. That's when outsourcing becomes important, especially in the tech world. Um, if you're not a person that does SEO all the time and you're doing digital marketing and you take on SEO 
roles, you're going to have a learning curve that goes beyond your scope. And now you're going to be buried trying to make a customer happy rather than partner with someone out there. There's so many small players out there are looking for partners to be stronger and continue to grow the business. Be smart on your positions. Don't, don't just overcommit. Yeah, people realize how complicated SEO is because you have a content person, copywriter, on and on and on, right? You, you actually you're supposed to hire like eight people for SEO, right? Like, so you, you want me to do eight jobs? I can't do that, right? Oh, absolutely. And you, and you think about the, the most important part of SEO, one of them is copy, right? And they'll outsource that to someone and then you get it back. And that's another thing. Understand who you're going after and understand that what you're going to get is copy. You might have to proofread three, four times and it's going to frustrate you because you're going to have to change it over and over. And sometimes you feel like you're doing all the work yourself. Yeah, especially our source of their third country. I mean, they speak English, but they don't speak American English, right? Exactly. <laughs> so talk some about your journey from the funeral procession to the tech, to being involved in tech. How did it come about? Wow. Um, so technology has been coming into the funeral profession for a long time. When I was with SCI, uh, we partnered with Salesforce and then Salesforce came in and we created something called the sales enablement tool, which is all of a sudden you're presenting with a tablet. You're no longer using a flip chart or, and it's no longer a presentation, it became a conversation that you're having with the families and selecting all their, whatever they need. It's already on a tablet and it made it very smooth and easy for you to actually uh, not only present, but anyone could have that conversation and not feel like they're selling. And the customer felt like they were making their decisions on their own. When I saw that work, it started happening. One Things, one of the biggest things I saw the gap was people were passing away and then they're coming to the funeral home with a cell phone or an iPad and all these apps and they couldn't get into that's pictures, that's information, the, the credit card companies. There's 30 million people that are dead that are on Facebook today and no one knew what would happen with those digital assets. And I always wondered what's going to happen. And then one day, Ricard Steiber came to Seattle. We had a conference here in Seattle. And he actually found me on the floor of the conference and says, I want to talk to you. And I, and I wasn't hearing it. I was done. And he showed me good trust and I was done. As soon as I saw that, I knew this is the solution. Our digital world, our analog world are connected. There's no turning back. That's what, I mean, Daniel, Daniel our, our co-founder said, we're, we're intertwined. There's no separating them. So let's have a solution to protect those digital assets. And that's why I ended up here. I know I was on LinkedIn. I'm, of course, I was on LinkedIn. I came across a profile. This guy's he's passed away like three years ago, right? His LinkedIn profile is still active, right? Like, yes. Yeah, it's, it's a, that's a tough one right there. Well, you know, the, the platforms are designed to get users and get a lot, a lot of members. Uh, they're not designed they're, they're to- They did a lot, right? Yeah. Try, to, try to kill a, a Facebook account or, a, or an Instagram account or a Snapchat account. It, 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 they just don't go away easy. Unless they kill it for you, right? Yes. So- how did you deal with this as you're doing funeral sales, like you're doing sales for funeral homes? You ever had this response, like, this is like, you know, how for this, like, you know, why are you calling me for? No one in my family's dying. This is creepy. This is not right. You know, you're jinxing us. How do you deal with that kind of stuff? Oh, wow. So I've, I've coached a lot of people in sales in the funeral profession. And, and here's the reality. The mortality rate in every state in the U.S. is 100%. <laughs> that, that's not going away, right? Uh, one of the biggest... Um, offenders in this field is us veterans, because I can't tell you how often I hear, oh, it's all taken care of. It's all taken care of. Well, it's not. We get a hole in the ground, a flag and a stone. That's all we get from the VA. If you qualify, if you were a reservist and never served a day active duty, you do not qualify for burial in a, in a national cemetery. And I mean, those spaces are getting crowder and crowder, right? Yes. Yes. So being proactive on this approach will really protect your family. That's one of the reasons good trust is here. That's one of the reasons people companies like SCI went to Dignity Memorial, went into the, the sales enablement tablet because it's really softens the approach and makes people think about it because the ultimately is if you do not know what's going to happen to you when you pass away, you're going to leave it behind to your family. Um, if someone, when it comes to sales in the funeral profession, the, the, the rule is three. If someone tells you, I'm not interested, I'm not interested, I'm not interested, don't call them again, leave them alone. You can send them emails, you can send them uh, direct mail, but respect that because it's a different profession. There's a, there's a sanctity to what we do. It's almost like a, a religion in a, in a weird way. What happens to people like they have no family, they're poor, they're destitute and they die. Does it, I guess the government buries them somewhere or what's the, how does that work? You know, that that's really important when you have this decedents that are actually have, have no one. There are contracts in different States where 
the, the state will do the research and try to find a next of kin. If they don't, then of course they become a ward of state and they eventually get cremated and then scattered. Yeah, that's pretty unfortunate. Is there a difference between like getting buried in the ground and cremated? Of course, there's a difference, but is it like is a difference on price? Is it like personal choice or like I know some religions like they can't get cremated? How's all that work? Well, that's that's a whole other podcast, but I'll I'll, I'll give you the gist of it. There there's a there's a space for permanent placement for everyone that wants to be placed somewhere, uh, and there's a there really is an option for just about every single budget if you plan ahead. If you wait till the last minute and walk into a cemetery, you think about Seattle, you think about San Francisco, the, the high real estate markets, the ground that you're going to use in order to build a mausoleum or be buried in the ground continues to go up in price because the taxes keep going up every year. And then people are going in and they think it's going to cost two, 3000 Well, it could easily cost $50,000 or you could spend as little as $1,200 with, with whatever it is that you're deciding to do. Um, just know what traditionally your family has done and then follow that. Or if you want to be rogue and, and do something different, like being cremated and scattered in the ocean, some people do that. I'm not a fan of it because then you can't ever go visit. Yeah. Um, but everyone's got their thing. Uh, different religions have to be buried within 24 hours. Some religions cannot use a casket. They have to be buried on the ground. Other religions, doesn't matter. Uh, and some people that are agnostic, they'll, they'll choose either burial, cremation, or a private family estate. It doesn't matter. It's up to you. But it's better to talk about that stuff ahead of time, definitely. So land from cemeteries, this public land, private land, and how do we get more land for cemeteries? For cemeteries, because we're definitely running out of space, I think. Uh, well, cemeteries are, um, are are slowly filling up in the U.S., and there, there are some new ones being created. But there's plenty of uh, spaces available probably for the next 100 years uh, in cemetery spaces in the U.S., um, as we continue, people go vertical and they, that means mausoleum spaces and columbariums. Cremation is up. So most people are being cremated and placed in niches that are, have glass front and, and lighted, which is kind of neat because you can have this glass front niche. And now when you go visit grandpa, there's pictures of him and trinkets and his medals or whatever it is. And it tells a story rather than just a, a stone with a line across it. So let's switch subject real fast. So you involved in something called Wide World of Sales Conference for IC, ICCFA. What is, what is ICCFA? What is that? That's an International Cremation uh, and Cemetery Association of North America. Um, so it's, um, it's really a large group that we actually... So we're kind of not changing the subject. No, we're not changing the subject. <laughs> um, but, but what it is, it, it teaches you uh, a tangible project. So we take, it's kind of like Dead Talks. It's called TED Talks. That's what we call it. It's Dead Talks. Um, like dead. <laughs> Same concept. Um, you have different speakers, 18 minutes, they get up there, they try to knock it out with, within 10 minutes. And it, it's fantastic because you get blurbs of knowledge from different people. And then we bring in a couple of keynotes and they do their thing. And then you have the annual conference that they come into. So Andy, it's not like you're pretty good. I, I'll presume I've never seen you publicly speak in front of crowds, but I'm guessing you're pretty good at public speaking. Um, how do you become such a good public speaker and what lessons or advice have people like maybe not comfortable or doubt their ability to speak in public? Well, um, so English was not my first language. Um, so understanding what your limitations are, whether you're writing your speech or someone else is writing it for you, uh, make sure they know what words you need to avoid, because if you say the words wrong, people won't, won't, won't capture it. But um, Professor Housen uh, was my sociology professor in, in college. And I never forgot that day where he walked in the room, he walked in late, he slammed this briefcase on the counter and immediately started telling us a story. And it, he captured his audience in a way I'd never seen before. And I wanted that so bad. And I wanted to be able to do that so bad. So I, I you know, I work on the craft. I, I speak when I'm, I'm nervous, um, it, it wasn't easy. Uh, the first time I ever got in front of a very, very large crowd and spoke, I was as nervous as it gets. However, um, eventually you, you're, you're never not nervous. You're, you're always more uh, worried that you're going to let down your audience by not giving them what they want. Yeah, I think most people don't realize that. You're, you're always, I don't care how many times you do public speak, you're always going to be kind of nervous, kind of afraid, right? It, it never goes away. It's like, and people don't get that, I don't think. Yeah. You, you must be nervous. Like me, whenever I'm nervous, I think I do a good job. But the time I'm like, I got this. I completely like blow right. Whenever time I, I'm overconfident, I, I completely jack it up. Well, I'll tell you a funny, real quick, funny story. Um, I was speaking at the Memorial Day observance ceremony in San Jose, California, and I had um, 
a, a great group of friends that came to 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 actually be at, at the uh, in the audience. There was over two thousand people there. Gold Star families were there, uh, having a great time. And I'm up there, and I'm the MC. And as I'm going through reading, I was tired, and I did not get enough rest the night before because I had a bunch of military friends that came into town. Shame on me. And I had uh, a, an active duty Marine Corps general that was our guest of honor. And every time I said World War One, World War Two, I said World War One, World War Two. And at the end of my my whole spiel and everything's done, uh, Sergeant Major Larry Lichty, he's sitting in the front row and he looks at me, hey, Andy, I said, what? He says, woo, woo, woo. So you're going to make mistakes. If you can't laugh at yourself, who can? Um, just sometimes just being yourself, getting up there and, and not even having a script at times. It's fun. Just for me, it's not good because I go off script and then I'm talking for three minutes about something I don't remember what I was talking about. Yeah, my process I always like practice like three or four times. Like, you know, I, I you know, rehearse in front of myself. One thing I can't do, I can't rehearse in front of someone else, right? I just can't do it, right? I, I won't say anything. I rehearse in front of myself, say it out loud, practice, practice. But regardless of how many times I rehearse, I always say something different when I start doing for real, right? It comes the same subjects, but I just use different words. And half the time when I finish talking, I have no clue what I said, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, Sometimes even when it's difficult, you're even better. You rise up to the occasion. One time I was in Vegas speaking uh, in front of uh, the same audience I want to be in with basically next week in Vegas. So we were actually doing our, our big event while we're in sales. And this is the first time I'm ever speaking in front of my peers. And that many of them it was a full packed room or 500 of them in there. And that was intimidating for me. That day before I lost my voice, I was hoarse and I'm drinking everything I possibly could. And I'm getting on stage and I'm talking like this, right? So I put the mic really close to my mouth and I, and I got up there and I'm like, what am I going to do? So as soon as I got up there, I ad-libbed and I, and I looked at everyone, I'm going to ask a favor of you. <laughs> and they all laughed. And just because they laughed, you know, don't laugh at me because I'm going to talk. And I did my whole shtick and, and I pulled it out. And eventually I was able to project my voice. I finished. I had no voice left, but it was probably one of the best presentations I've done. And I'm sure you'll never forget that presentation yeah. either. So would you prefer to talk to 100 people that you know, or 100 people that you don't know? Oh, wow. Um, probably 100 people I don't know. I'm the same way here. Yeah. I'm the same way. <laughs> 100 people I don't, know, I don't know, without a doubt. So, Andy, let's talk about your company, Good Trust. Can you talk about how the company got started, the vision for it, how the idea got started, what the company's focused on now, and what the future plan is for, the, for Good Trust? Oh, great. Um, so Ricard Steiberg, our CEO, uh, his, uh, he had, his father passed away during COVID. And during COVID also, he had a few friends that passed away. And that's when he discovered that there was no solution for him to be able to close out his father's digital accounts. And his friends' families were calling him saying, hey, how do I fix this? Uh, how, how do I get there? I mean, this is the, they're calling the guy who started the first VR store for HTC, where Oculus was actually selling their products. It was this is Ricard Steiberg that knows everyone and did, couldn't, couldn't figure out how to do this. So he's, he saw there was a problem and set out to fix it. Uh, in the process, he partnered up with, of course, with Daniel and, and Al Seberg and, and Ricard Steiberg actually wrote the book, Digital Legacy. And, and that book itself put them together as they built this website and created this platform to have a solution for a, for a problem that's only getting worse every single day. Um, in the process, he discovered that two thirds of Americans do not have a will. Uh, whether old, young, it doesn't matter, two thirds do not have a will. Either they don't, do not think they have enough assets or they, they think they have too many assets and it's gonna to be too expensive. Uh, having something rather than nothing, right? Better to have and not need than need and not have. So we created the free will online where we have a platform where you can go in for $0, zero credit card required, go in, create your will, download it and print it it's legal in every state as long as you have your two signatures. Some places you have to get, get it notarized, always consult with local laws. But they created this and they started adding things like future messages. They started adding things that are really like singing heads, which is fun and animating uh, old photos, which is very special for some people and creepy for others. Um, it, it's just a very interesting tool. But the digital vault that was created is different than a password manager, it's different than Facebook, it's different than any other, other things because it's not an open source. This is a, a website that's for you, a place for you to store your documents and you only share them with those people you want at the time of death, immediately or whenever you want to occasionally. And only that person has access 
and no one else does, which is really, really um, groundbreaking. And so what's the future plans for the company? Like you, you're trying to get, get a certain type of, are you trying to convert the two thirds of that world, like only a one third of that will or anything well, like that? I, will, I would love to see um, more people in the US take advantage of something as important as a free will. Uh, right now we're working to, of course, continue to grow. We, we're over 60 countries are using our platform. They can, the, the will's not legal in all those countries. We're working on that right now. Um, but our, our goal is to have as many Americans utilizing a free will and being protected, at least given answers to their families at a time. Uh, we also have a pet directive that's actually going out. You'd be surprised. People care about their pets more than they care about grandma. In the funeral business, people spend more money on their pets than they do on their humans. I can believe that. So like, without the, a doubt. this pet directive we have coming out is going to be groundbreaking. I think that's going to be big. A lot of people will jump on that. Yes. So uh, off the subject again, I know way off the subject, a lot of people like they post on social media, right? They're young. And let's say they post questionable content, right? But yet that's going to be on there when they're like, when their grandkids look at it, right? They're like, grandma, granddad, what are you doing, right? Like, I think that's a challenge too, right? How do you take that off the off social media? And, and that's great. Um, so one of the good things that we use with Good Trust, um, we've actually mapped out how to close out, uh, hide, delete, memorialize all of these different accounts, including bank accounts and all the other, even crypto. Um, one of the things we have is called a dead man switch. So you can actually select accounts that will be deleted upon your death. And we check on you as often as you want us to. And literally you get an email. Are you still there? Are you still alive? Click here. If you do, we're good. If we think you're gone, we we actually verify that you have passed using social security and your trusted contact, the person you put in charge of letting us know whether or not you're still alive. And even when they verify, we follow a certain profit process to make sure you're not by trying to contact you every way you, you've given us. And if that's the case, everything you told us to get rid of, poof, disappears. How does security work in this? Like, does every, like, like if someone has four kids, all four kids get access to it, a parent decides who has access to it, how does that work? It's up to the person that has the account, who they give access to and when. It's not immediate. So you go on the platform, you actually map out all of your social media platforms. Maybe I want to have my daughter have access to uh, LinkedIn for me because she's maybe posting content on my behalf. I can literally on the platform, click on a toggle switch that's on the platform and gives her access through her good trust account. All of it is encrypted. We use the Microsoft Azure server. So everything goes in well encrypted. And we know that if you hack Azure, good luck because then we're all in big trouble. Um, it, it's, it's really a closed session with the person that's using it. And only those you give access to will have it. And if I want her to no longer have access, I just toggle off and it removes it from her Good Trust account. So if a Good Trust, it can be used when the person is alive too, correct? Yes. So this also almost be like a social media platform for people, right? Well, it's not social media. I call it a lifestyle management tool because social media, you're posting and people are seeing it, right? You're, you're not doing that with Good Trust. We don't have a page where you're liking things. You, you're sharing memories, you're sharing documents. I'll give you an example, your vaccination card. Um, I needed it the other day. Instead of having it on a picture and trying to fumble through, I, I just opened my Good Trust account and there's my vaccination card. There's my social security card. There's my passport. And it's all in my, in my platform. It's securely stored and I have access to it all the time. I needed to send my passport to someone when I was in Florida. With Good Trust, I just grant them access through their Good Trust account and they download it and they have it and it's securely stored so it's not out there in open uh, text messaging or an email where someone can actually hack it and steal my information. So I'm talking to Jared Otis here, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm presuming that most rich people, if, if, so if you had a picture between a rich person, a poor person or had a will, it's going to be the rich person, right? How do you convince more, you know, quote, middle class or low middle class people to have wills and know the importance of it versus just you know, people with money? You know, um, my coworker, Heidi, <clears throat> she, um, she says, I don't have a will and I don't need one. And I said, why not? And she says, well, I don't have anything important. Well, she is actually engaged to be married. She's got a beautiful ring on her finger. She's got a puppy. Um, she's got a few things that really mean a lot to her. And she's got a little sister. And I said, what's going to happen to that ring if something happens to you? Or that, or, or that puppy. Or that puppy. And she, that puppy is her baby. And we started talking through it. And all of a sudden, she had this aha moment. She's like, wow, I just didn't think that I was wealthy enough to have a will. I said, anyone that, anyone that has a thing that they I mean, want any, someone to any have. trinket, you know, like, you know, I'll, your I'll mother, something yeah, with your it. mother might have a tea set, you know, the kid's going to fight over, you never know. This is a challenge coin, right? 
a challenge coin. This is actually my challenge coin. Um, and I created my challenge coin, but I have other challenge coins that are very important. Uh, matter of fact, this one, I'm do doing it the wrong way, but this one I brought for you. This is my challenge oh, coin. I'm presenting you with a challenge coin today, even though I didn't shake your hand and give it to you. Um, but the challenge coin, that it's, the other one that's in my pocket is John Caviani, Medal of Honor recipient, uh, Vietnam, Army. Uh, that guy was one of my mentors. And my son, Cavelli, he's in the Army, and he's a lieutenant in the Army. And this challenge coin is one of the most important things as far as challenge coins to me, because this man um, not only was a friend, he was a mentor. He got me out of dark places when I was going down the wrong path. And um, I want Cavelli to have this. If I had nothing else in life, at good trust, I can guarantee you that someone's going to read that this challenge coin goes to Cavelli when I pass away. That's how important little things are. Sometimes it's not the diamond ring, it's the trinket. The thing that someone might see, like my little bottle of water from um, Bella Woods, the Fountain of Bella Woods. I have a vial of water from the Fountain of Bella Woods. Most people don't know what that is, but guess what? Other people that are important to me know what it is, and they know who's getting it. So that's that's what it's about. So Andy, how often does somebody update their will? Oh, uh, you can update your will so often. I always recommend look at your will every year uh, if you have time. Um, if something has changed in your life, you we accumulate stuff. Think about all of these subscription systems, right? We have like, you can subscribe for, for bourbon. You can subscribe for a box of all kinds of survival yeah, stuff. All the five and $10 add up pretty quickly. Yes. Um, all, all that stuff adds up. Every year you have new trinkets, new toys, new things. Uh, just make sure it's covered. That way you do not leave the big question mark, right? There's two questions that will never be answered when you pass away. Did I do the right thing? Did I do what they would have wanted if someone had to take care of you for your funeral? But when it comes to your will, did I do the right thing with everything they had? Did I do what they would have wanted with everyone that should have received something? I should have had my grandfather's guitar when he passed away and his tools. I never received them because there was family drama. Someone ended up selling all the tools, which should have gone to me. I was a young guy. I was in the Marine Corps. I was PFC in the Marine Corps when that happened. And I, was, I, was, I had to help with that funeral. And then his guitar ended up under a bed for many, many years. And one day I saw it in my niece's closet and I have to have it repaired because it was in, in poor shape because guitars have to be stored correctly. That should have never happened. And if someone would have taken the time to write a will or at least what they wanted to do with their stuff, it would have worked out, but they thought they did not have anything that was valuable, so they didn't bother. And how many people say, you know, we don't need a will, there's no family drama. And sure enough, as soon as someone dies, all the family drama comes out. Wow. After um, over 20 years being around the death care industry, I can tell you there's always some drama, but the most uh, amount of drama we ever get is when there's not any clear direction on what to do with your, you physically and all of your assets. And now with your digital assets, <laughs> I can tell you that you need to be proactive on this because that is the fingerprint, that legacy you leave behind. How much dust do you want on it? How much do you want to go away when you're gone? And how much do you want preserved so you live on digitally? When you do a will, should you like give access to like your, your spouse, your parents? Like, is there any recommendation on that? Like, if I do a will, who should I tell my family this is where the will is at? I'm glad you asked. Um, one of the other reasons Good Trust was created the way it is, because most people will prearrange their funeral, do a will, do all the things right, and then they stick it all in a safety deposit box, lock it, and tell no one about it. Then you've died. You've been at a bank. They don't even know you have a bank account at. Exactly. Yes. Because, you know, you don't want anyone to find your stuff because we know a lot of friends that we have that are that way. And now you've passed away. You've been, they say they couldn't afford anything. So they cremated you. They didn't know you had a funeral plan. They didn't know you had a will on what to do with your things. And then one day they find the safety deposit box. They open it up and they Wait, realize, what's, this, what's this key to? Yeah, and they find out you wanted to be buried, that you had it all paid for, that you had a will, that you wanted your kid to have your car, you didn't want it sold. All these things that can, it's not just about giving them directions, it's about not hurting them after you're gone. So, Andy, one of the things in your platform is something called future measures, right? So, my question is like, do y'all kind of censor this? Because I can't imagine like someone doing a future message saying something like, you know, something negative to a family, like, hey, well, Michael is my favorite son, or hey, I did this, or something negative, right? How do you control that? Was like, you just say, this is on the family, we have nothing to do with it. Whatever you upload into Good Trust, whether it's videos, um, we, we do not have any access to your data. So the 
the, so that's personal family so business. Someone gets creative and says, you know, uh, to everyone, um, I'm not here anymore. And whatever they say, it's on them. However, we, um, I, I, I really do think, and, and, and we haven't seen this happen. We haven't had anyone say, hey, this happened. What we've had had happen um, is people actually sharing future messages. It's almost like a time capsule, right? You know, we'll bury them, we'll put all kinds of trinkets in them and bury them and open them back up because the future message, you can send the message to yourself. Uh, like right now, New Year's resolutions, we are encouraging people, tell yourself what your resolutions are in a future message to be delivered in six months and 12 months or three every three months. That message comes to you. That way you, you tell yourself where you stand on your resolutions and record yourself another video. It's self-accountability video, right? Or you can use that same feature in a memory care facility, for example, when someone has Alzheimer's, they have the moment of clarity, we put that on video right away. Talk to your kids right now. Tell them what you're thinking. It's beautiful. It's powerful. I remember John Wick when the puppy showed up. Well, you can time your future message to land along with a flower delivery or a puppy delivery if you know you're terminal and you're going to pass away. Or us that we're in the military, when you're deployed, you got to write that letter, that last letter, right? Yeah. Uh, what? How powerful would a video be over a letter? Yep. And it will only deliver because you select a specific date or time or you select after I die. So there's a lot of uses for this. I, I know my, my daughter uses it to record my, my granddaughter's uh, growth. She takes the video and scratches the wall. And as they're growing, that's how they use it. So I don't remember this, but a few years ago, maybe less than that, there was a funeral in Ireland. This guy had said it where they had a pre-recording in, in, in the coffin. It's like, let me out of here. Let me out of here. I'm not dead. Let me out. You know, he was like a no prank sort of stuff, you know. Yes. But it's like real so realistic, right? People are like, I know it's a prank, but is it really a prank, you know? No, and, and pe people have fun with that. I mean, um, that that's the definition of someone who put the fun in funeral. Uh, and I'm, I've seen some very creative uh, headstones. There's one that, that literally is an angle. It says dead. Um, a funeral is a celebration of life. And if you were a prankster and really is a, an indication of a life well lived. So make it about you, not just a, about sadness. When, when you're just focused on the sad piece, then, then you're missing the point. It's about who was this person and how they identify with the rest of you. Let's make that capture it and, and make it pop. And if you make videos, for example, with good trust and record all those memories, all that stuff can be used at your funeral especially if you give someone access to your Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, all those different platforms, because then they capture who you are, what's important to you, that trusted contact that you have, your kid, your wife, your, your best friend, whoever it may be. And now you use, utilize this to really um, celebrate that life and have a great memorial service where people can laugh because without laughter, what is there? And you said all this is on the Microsoft or Sure Cloud? Yes. Um, you might not be able to answer this, but in, can you tell me, if you can't, you might not be able to, why you decided Azure versus AWS versus Rackspace versus something, something else? Well, the, we're part of the startup program for Microsoft. Okay. So th they actually have a special program for, for startups and so does Google. So that's who we work with. Okay. Okay. Um, so, so next, we talk about sales, talk about public speaking. Is there anything I should ask you I haven't asked you yet or anything else you want to talk about? You know, um, there's nothing that um, I've ever talked about that that's as compelling and moving and gives me more, I guess, um, positive reviews than when I talk about a personal story and how it changed me. Uh, if you're out there speaking and you can relate anything that's personal, about, that it really matters to whatever your content is, it makes for a better conversation. My friend Chuck Gallagher, Chuck Gallagher um, is a public speaker, an author. He wrote a book, Second Chances. He talks about his, he actually had a Ponzi scheme when he was younger. He went down the rabbit hole, got arrested, went to prison, came out. And now he speaks to the FBI and the Secret Service about um, character and integrity. He, he's an ethics speaker. And his story, the way it worked and how it changed him, actually makes it so that people listen. Ricard Steiberg and Daniel Siebert, they wrote the book because they wrote that book about their story. It makes the message of good trust that much more, I guess, interesting to people. So I believe last year, see, uh, good trust raised a seed around. Can you talk about the process of that, like how challenged that was or maybe how easy it was, you know, I was all involved with that. 
Well, you know, when, when you're a startup and um, you have zero dollars coming in and a lot of dollars coming out and you have a concept, uh, it takes a special breed of person to pitch this over and over and, and over again. That's another part of sales, right? Yes. I mean, yes. Who was doing the farmers? They're selling the company, right? Yes. And you're selling the company and you're, and you have to have the right team and you have to have a team that when you show them on a board and say, these are the people who are going to get us to the next place. And this is why um, that that's important. And, and bringing in the right key players. Um, one of the, one of the things I learned with, with startups is you can, um, you, you have to pass the, what, what someone said to me was the stupid test, which is often they get their first round of seed funding and everyone gets this massive salary where they're, everyone's driving brand new cars. And, and that's usually the biggest mistake you can make because you might raise $3 million, but $3 million, $3 million is not a lot of money. Even if $5 million, not a lot of money. If I was paying the yeah. Bob's $100,000 and sells people, if you give everyone a $100,000 salary, you're pretty much soon broke. Yes. I mean, if your if your burn rate is is greater than what your funding is, uh, and, and you have a uh, you know three million dollars and you run through it in six months, then you're you're dead in the water. So you have to be smart. You have to be at times frugal. Um, and like I work with a lot of guys from Sweden. They like to say that you got to be scrappy, which means make it work with what you've got. And all of us wear different hats. Um, and that's something that we always tell anyone who invests is we're not going just to spend money to spend money. Every one of us wears a different hat, but we all wear each other's hats. Uh, on a weekend, if someone's not available, I'll, I'll go in and, and do all other things. I have nothing to do with business development just to be supportive to the team. We all pitch in. Uh, Bjorn, I work with Bjorn every single day. And it's funny because um, we were pitching a, a client and the client is a friend of mine and he had an AOL email. And I jokingly said, this is one of those guys that's not very tech savvy. And I said, hey, do you still update your MySpace account? And Bjorn's like, hey, I was, I was a VP of MySpace. <laughs> he had no idea that the guy I work with every day was number two of MySpace. You know? So you never know who you're going to run across uh, in the tech world because we're all working so hard. And it's refreshing to see when you're going through receipts of funding, right? the, the rounds, um, when you, the value proposition is there and part of that value proposition is the people you're going to have a win is a good trust station at a seattle or san francisco someplace else mellow park mellow park okay yes and i'm presuming all, you're a, a, a remote company no we all work remotely yes talk about the challenge of being remote because some people don't work correctly remotely right how do you figure like this person is a good remote worker like me i'm not a good remote worker right if i, if I work from home I'm watching TV, I'm making dinner, you know, I'm taking naps, you know, so I'm not the best remote worker, right? How do you make sure the person who remote can actually do remote work? You know, um, my sister-in-law said this to me um, last year, which was, you know, now we work remotely, right? It, we say we work from home. Well, it's if you're not careful, you'll be living where you work, which is the big difference, right? You have to have that, you have to watch that TV at lunchtime. I, I get up and whenever I grab lunch, if I can grab lunch on, on a specific day, just sit down and listen to the, the stocks or the so news. You gotta, you, gotta, you gotta still have got boundaries, you, you right? Got, you gotta disconnect. Um, as a company, we're all remote. We have people in Sweden, we have people all, all, over, all over the world and we'll have a culture call every month. We have a culture call. We have, uh, and, and Heidi are, uh, I mean, she is uh, really, really something else. Heidi does so much for our company. She's involved in sales, she's involved in HR, she's involved in, she does it all. And she put together this culture call where we get to know each other. We, uh, it's not about work. It's about laughing. It's about doing exercises, uh, doing different um, quizzes. And she does these videos with all of us and we have fun together. So we've built a culture away from each other. Uh, we were just together for the first time uh, right before Christmas in Menlo Park. Not all of us, but most of us. And we took pictures and we did some, some great team building Things. And when you are sitting around a circle and you've worked with these people and you've never been next to each other and you have to look at the person next to you and say, I'm grateful for you because of X and everyone had something to say about everybody. That, that's because we have a culture of inclusion, of transparency. And we every, every week we have multiple calls. Where we're all working together. It's a joint working session. You join if you want. You don't have to be there. Sometimes we just join, put it on mute and keep working just to hear our coworkers working. It feels like you're in the office. Nothing will ever take place, uh, replace, I think, a cultural environment where everyone's together because there's something about the people factor, uh, being able to go and grab lunch with your coworker and talk about life. But uh, I think productivity actually does go up.
Yeah, I believe so it. too. A lot of people say you can't build a culture remotely, but I believe I'm really a big believer you can build a culture remotely doing stuff like you do, you know. But I think it can definitely be a challenge, right? Yeah, I mean, going backwards though, um, like for example, Google, um, uh, let's use Amazon, for example. Most of their workers are still working remotely. When you're in the office, they had a culture, you bring your puppy to work, you, you, all these things. Now you don't have that anymore. And that was what made the job sexy for you. When you start out remotely, and this is all you are, anything you add to it, just it's exciting. Versus the other side, when you already had all that, and you're trying to replace it by doing culture calls and all the other things, that's when it gets tricky because your, your team, your captive audience is diminishing because they're, they're they just don't feel like they're part of something great. Yeah, I know the studies are showing if you work in the office forty hours, forty hours a week, you actually only actually doing real work twenty hours, right? Because you're on Facebook, you're like you're both from your friends, right? So are you doing forty hours a week? Yeah. And then I think it's actually if you work remotely, you actually work more hours because like the, the desk is right there, right? Let me let me wake up at six in the morning to go to work, right? So how do you prevent your people at your company like, getting burned burned down and working too much? Uh, you know, we we have um we have a really good way of just not micromanaging people. Uh, if someone needs to take a break, they take a break. Um, if I, if I don't feel like the other day I was exhausted, um, I didn't sleep well. And I got up and I, and I, and I told the two people I was going to be on the phone with, Hey, I'm, 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 I'm sleeping in out because I had my booster shot. I didn't feel well. I, it really floored me. And everyone was more concerned about me being okay and healthy than me being on, on calls. Um, you can, you can really burn people out if you have too many calls. Um, let people do their job, and and as long as productivity is there, it, it should be fine. But yes, you you gotta you gotta be mindful as a leader. You have to be mindful of the balance, and remember that if they're home, if, especially if they're working from home, and if they have kids, or that that's gonna really cut into that time because the fact that they're present in the environment makes their children want to be close to them. I think that's the best thing about remote work, right? Like, suppose I work for you, right? But we were working in the office nine to five. Am I going to come to you and say, hey, Andy, my kid has a play at 2 p.m. Maybe I do, maybe I don't, right? But if I work remotely, I ain't got to tell you, right? Hey, I'm going, I'm, you know, I'm going to remote work and do my job later on, right? I think that's one of the biggest pluses about remote work. You can do those family type of things without telling everyone you're coming to your business. Yeah. And I mean, and for, for me, and we're a small team of good trust. If I'm going to be out of pocket, every one of the team knows so they can pinch hit if I need them to, right? And vice versa. I mean, we had someone that going to Tahoe, they're going snowboarding, let go, have fun. Uh, we have one of our uh, team members loves to uh, free climb. He, he does the crazy rock climbing and it's, it's insane. Like the other day um, on Slack, we're sharing photos and he sends a picture like, what are you doing today? And he's literally hanging up of, of a rock. Um, it, you have to have th those moments. For me, if I don't disconnect, my creativity goes down. So I need to disconnect. And sometimes I do sound silly. I'll go outside and pull weeds. And that's what I do my best thinking. So you're, you're coming up people in different time zones, I guess, in different countries. Mm -hmm. How do you like, I think, but how do you make sure all those people stay connected? Like, how do you make sure like, if you do a meeting in Seattle at 8 a.m. in the morning, it's like, like 2 p.m. If it's 2 p.m. in Seattle, it's like, like 3 in the morning somewhere else. Like, how do you make sure all these meetings line up with people's time zones and stuff? We, we, do, we do push calls later in the day or early in the day. Um, just to accommodate for the different time zones when we have our culture calls or sometimes if someone cannot cannot be there we have a recap after every call um one of our team members in new york iman she is very good at taking notes and she sends out a report of everything that was discussed during the call and if someone wants to collaborate or anything else uh, we do that like when we're doing new content creation um and we're using canva uh and we're going to different platforms we are all able to contribute by typing in what we think we see and collaborate. And then when we have a culture call or a team call, everyone can say, Hey, I, I read what you were talking about. Let's make this change. Let's work on that. Um, it's really neat uh, how, how it works. And, and the key for us is there are no egos. Um, I've, I've never worked in an environment with so many extremely talented individuals that have accomplished so much in their lives that are not ego forward. So I'm going to guess that, you know, good for us and go grow, grow, grow. And you're going to need to build out your sales team more, right? What's your plan of like building on like, like great salespeople to work for you in the future? Like you have a recruiting plan in place already. You already have, you already have like a bench of talent. You're going to reach out to, Hey, I can hire you now. Or what's your plan for that? Well, I, I have a good, um, 
a good source, a bench of talent, for lack of a better term, um, people that I know that I would be reaching out to, not just me, but Bjorn and Ricard and our whole team. That we They've worked in the tech world for a long time. Um, when it comes to scaling up, it's finding the right person that not just only fits the business, but fits our, our culture uh, that gets it, that's willing to do whatever it takes. Um, it, that's, it takes a special person. Yeah, I think so many people miss the point to have a bench, a talent, a bench, if you want to call it right. A lot of people like, oh, I'll go look for people when I need X, right? And by then it's, it's too late, right? You got to have your, someone you can reach out to. You could be in an uphill climb doing such a great job building your business. Everything's going great. And then one person gets lured away from your team and you do not have their replacement ready. You're going to see a dip in sales, a dip in performance. Um, you might have a ripple effect where mul multiple people leave. So you have to always be prepared for the inevitable, right? Um, everyone is replaceable. You just don't want to have to replace everyone. It, in smaller teams, of course, is one way. Uh, when I've had large, very large teams, you're always recruiting. You're constantly out there recruiting. You're going to, re to job fairs. You're going to uh, all of the different recruiting events in the community just to source new talent, fresh faces, right? Change of pace, change of pace. You always want to be turning your bottom 3%. But when it comes to tech in a, in a company like ours, to, to inject a new person in, it's gotta be the right fit, it's gotta be the right person. What we're lucky is we have a lot of people that are either interns or people that are in, in, the, in the company already that are doing different roles that we can scale up and bring them into the next role because everyone's cross-trained. So that's a big piece. If you're not big, cross-train everyone. So if someone is not there, the other person can step in. I know the big thing is, is ABC always be closed. And I also believe in ABR always be recruiting. You got to say that they're almost equally right. But only, only closers get coffee. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Um, can, can you uh, share your social media links with us for you and your company so people can reach out to you? Well, it's uh, mygoodtrust.com is our website. And um, on, on LinkedIn, on Instagram, and on Facebook, we're all Good Trust. Uh, you'll see us. It's uh, at Good Trust. It's... Um, it's a fun, we, we, we share a lot of good, fun things. It's not just about the company. We're sharing recipes, we're sharing ideas, lifestyle management tools, really come join us. And, uh, you know, I, I think I told you at the beginning, uh, I wanted to make sure that uh, you, you, it, you share with your readers uh, and all of your followers that anyone listening to this podcast gets the benefit of actually getting good trust for free for three months. I want them to go in, tinker with it, give you feedback on what they think, create their free will, um, and all they have to do is put in the code Cavanos HR. Yes. So when you bring on salespeople, do you have like a, so you do you have some kind of coaching plan or training plan for them? Like some kind of onboarding plan for your salespeople and another, a part two when they're not like performing the standards, like a coaching plan to get them up to speed. Well, it's look in any environment, uh, when you bring in new salespeople, you have to have one, a cadence of accountability. Uh, you have to establish what the requirements are because if people do not know where the finish line is, they'll never know where to run. Um, so you have to give them goals that are clear, crisp, specific, right? Do SMART goals, uh, if, if anything. And I mean, I hate all the little acronyms, but that one makes sense, right? Uh, using SMART goals. But then develop a training plan where you can teach them how to win, teach them what failure looks like, and teach them what success looks like. And then you got to eventually set them loose. Uh, but you always do the one thing I always say as a leader in sales, you coach, trade, and develop every single day. If you're here to tell a salespeople, hey, salesperson, this might not be the career for you. We need to look for something else for you to do because this you're not cutting it. Have you ever had that conversation? Um, not, a, you know, I've had that conversation maybe once or twice because here's the thing. If you're always coaching and training and clear and transparent with the people that you work with, if they don't feel like they work for you and they feel like they work with you and you're constantly revisiting, um, I can't tell you how often I know this person is going to get it or they're going to leave. And they often leave before I even have to say goodbye because they say, this is too much. I can't, I can't learn this. Um, but I've had that conversation where, look, this might not be the right fit, but I always also believe that if someone's willing to come in, work hard and try so hard and they continue to fail, it might be a value for this person somewhere else within the organization. So always try to find if they're a good person, a good employee, just not successful at selling. Not Sales is not for everyone. Not everyone's going to really be that hero in the sales world, but that might be the person you switch on to an operational role and they thrive in it. Um, not everyone fits the same mold. And you got to be mindful of that because you might have a, 
a diamond in your hands, but you place the diamond in the wrong pile. Exactly. So Andy, uh, what kind of end of our talk? Do you have any advice or wisdom you want to give us? Well, uh, you know, just um, no matter what life throws at you, um, the highs, the lows, uh, don't give up. Um, make keep a journal of all the mistakes and all the wins and all the successes, and and write your story, whether you publish it or not. Write your story, so you don't forget. So you create that legacy that we're talking about. Um, record it in some way, shape, or form. Most importantly, protect what's most important to you. Uh, family, memories, and legacy. Use you use the Good Trust uh, account if you want to. You know, Cabinet HR. That's the code. You go in there. It says enter code. Uh, my email is Andy uh, mygoodtrust.com. Send me an email if you have any questions. And I uh, appreciate the time, man. Really. Yes. And to our listeners, we'll have the links to his uh, social media, his gift on the, on the show notes. Find the show notes at www.cabinethrblog.com. Be sure to subscribe and rate and review the Jason Cabinets experience on your favorite podcast form. form. Uh, Andy, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you. And to our listeners, remember to, great, to be great every day. Stop this. Now I got to stop everything. All right. Thanks, Andy. Hopefully that was at least sense to you. That was fun, man. That was fun. Um, yeah, it's funny. I, I actually did um, a big, a big presentation. My, my wife's making me write a Bible story book, uh, and I come out on stage and I knock on the table and I open up by saying, "Hello, my name is Andy Lopez. I work for Youth Opportunity Girl Limited. It's a program designed to keep me boosting our global today and dating for complete because I want to go to a college." I am selling today peanut butter clusters and the peanut brittle and the gummy bears and the rib turtle. Which one do you like best? That was my script. And I make the mistakes like I used to say yeah. it. And people will go, oh, no, we're not interested. Yes, which one? Yeah. Because I didn't speak English. Uh -huh. so I, and, I, and I realized that. So I started learning. I kept on acting like I didn't hear it because it, it was helping me. And I, I saw more candy than all these other kids. I was making more money than my mom. All because I believe. I believe in the system. I believe in the positive. I believe that I can do it. And uh, that's when I discovered, wow, this, this, this is selling. And then I started thinking, when I was even younger, like eight, in Puerto Rico, I had a shoeshine box. Mm -hmm. I'd get on the ferry that went from Catano to Levittown, uh, to, to San Juan, back and forth. And I would shine shoes. And this little eight-year-old kid, shiny shoes. I was normal back then. Yeah. And I always hustled. I got people to let me shine their shoes. Um, it, it was right before I went to the Marine Corps, my friend Angel and I needed money. Uh, my parents were broke. And he had this old banged up Mitsubishi out with a stallion, the hatchback, you know, with a hitch. And we went and bartered with a guy. I did a lot of work for this guy and got this water tank with a pressure washer. And we decided to start a detailing business. We made our own business cards. You remember, you used to buy the sheets and print them yeah. in a dot matrix printer and a baby doll detail. You know, I mean, ways that not going to make money. And it was all belief, though. I would go up to these buildings. I remember the first time I went in, he, 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 I didn't have a, a nice polo shirt. He got me a polo shirt. He said, put this on. You look nice. And start. And I said, what do I say? He says, I don't know. You figure it out. I got to the top floor and I walked in and I said, hey, how are you? I'm with baby doll detailing. And then he goes, oh, you think you'll wash the cars? I'm like, yes, yes. How many people were there again? And all of a sudden, I got, I got keys to Porsches. Yeah. To ben they have no idea who I am. Yeah. And I'm taking the keys to all these people's cars downstairs. And I'm in these cars. I'm like, oh, my God. So I'm signing them up. I didn't even have a driver's license. I didn't have a driver's license until I got out of the Marine Corps. Okay? <laughs> it's just, here we are power washing these cars. Oh, and, that's a great story. And, and we made money. Um, it was all because I believed I could do it. I mean, I could have gone in there and go, hey, I'm here to, to wash cars. Does anybody, anybody want me, us? you know, I have, a, I'm sorry I didn't call beforehand, but can I wash your car? Yeah, it's a yes, no question, no. Um, you know, it's just, uh, this is great. Um, if I'd run across anyone in Rosa that, that would want to that be great, yeah. interview, um, uh, it's, uh, you know, who might be interested in interview. I don't know if she's got the time. Carmen Best. I think I know her. She's like a black female recruiter. No, she's the prior police chief. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm talking about someone else. Yeah. No, she's she's black. 
uh, Carmen um, was the first black female uh, police chief in the yes. city of Seattle. I don't know if you guys bring up the name Black Beauty Dog. Yeah, yeah, which that was shocking because she was the front runner. Yeah. Um, but they hired a, a black female that was from New York City, so. Yeah, and they let, people that they hired, you, you, you kind of scratch your head because that must have been a political thing there. Yeah. Because she could have, she could have, she was like 300 officers, that's all she had. She was a detective, she wasn't even a chief. Um, I thought the only person that was going to be Carmen was the other police chief that she was, yeah. she had a, a more experience. Yeah, they did great at Carmen because that's awesome. All that shit went down to her and the mayor, it's like, man, she was, this movie just seemed shady. Like, I don't yeah. know, I don't know who's telling the truth why, but it's the whole thing that went down. Was I'm in her movie. circle, yeah. um, and I'm friends with Chief Diaz, mm-hmm. um, and it's, it's, it's crappy what they did. Um, the, the mayor, the mayor, she, she backstabbed everyone. Yeah. She was playing both sides. Yeah. So she would talk to Carmen and then go politicize it on the other side. But when you have a city council that doesn't believe in, in law enforcement, that doesn't believe in, in, in having. Like, I'm not saying we need to have police like beating the crap out of people, but still, like, right. like, 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 you walk down the street, you see people openly doing heroin, you know, it's like, I don't know. That bothers me. I mean, we were at Green Lake. My wife, wife grew up run in Green Lake. We, we always ran since I've been coming to Seattle over 12 years now. Uh, we go to Green Lake, right? Um, but here we are walking in Green Lake, and there's just, it's a campground. Yeah. And I told us that, you know, five years ago, six years ago, if I would have come here and wanted to pitch a tent with my grandkids to watch the sun set and watch the stars, I'd have been kicked out. Yeah. This is what I find wrong with it. Um, and there's meals everywhere. Oh, yeah. So it's it's unsafe to go yeah. and run I one time I was walking down by Pike, Pike Lake Market, and right in front of the Hard Rock Cafe, this lady was in the, in the, on the sidewalk. I mean, she just all projected up. She had an axe. She was hitting the axe on the sidewalk, right? And she was just walking by like, this bitch has a fucking axe. What the hell is going on here? Like, how is this possible? Uh, I, I don't even come downtown anymore without being armed. Yeah. Like, it's, uh, you know what? It doesn't make sense to me to have yeah. whatever you get. And it sucks. It sucks. Yeah. Um, but I'm even near my house, and we have um, one of the one of the big companies that deals with the homeless, um, providing benefits, which is my wife's cousin works for them. Um, they they bought a Holiday Inn on Aurora, mm-hmm. and they turned it into a place. And they put this huge fence around it. It looks like it looks like a compound. Yeah. But you know, it's keeping a lot of the Budget and homeless off the street, except yeah. they're not making them be off drugs. They're, yeah. they're actually giving them injection sites and all that stuff. But you heard the story about the, the story on one of the new movies about this guy who worked with a, as a head cook at a Harvard cafe, but he couldn't afford a house. He was living in camps, you know. So I mean, stories like that. It's just it's a hard. There's problem. people out there that are struggling. Look, my daughter, my daughter has got two kids. When they went to California with me, my kid one day decided that she was gonna be with Julius and. Wanted to move out. She didn't want to follow my rules. So I said, "What I will say is, you know, my house, my rules." And she goes, "I'm out." And I'm like, "What?" Because I'm 18, Dad. I'm out. And I was a mess. Like you living in California, like I was a mess, man. I was an absolute mess. And one of the officers that came to the house, she actually showed up with cops to get her stuff the next day. And I'm like, "What are you doing?" Yeah. And I know I was a cop, so he's like, "Can we leave?" Yeah. 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 Tough love. Yeah. And I'll be hard. I'm like, you know where we live, man. He says, "Yeah, I know." My kid was living in her car with her boyfriend, yeah. now husband, uh, and I wanted to come over there with him to fix it. And yeah. my wife's like, "Can't be." Yeah. She tried to get um, resources. Mm-hmm. She got pregnant. She was trying to get resources, and it's a lottery system. And yeah. she would go to the places, and she'd have these other women that know how to play the system yeah. that lied about what they had or didn't have. Yeah. And they were getting help, and I finally ended up having to get her an apartment and all that because I wasn't going to have my daughter. Yeah. I mean, this was a short time that yeah. they were living like that, and I knew where they were. And I had eyes on them all the time, but it, it made me realize that the, the, the system's really broken. Yeah. When you have a pregnant woman on the street that's not on drugs, yeah. that just wants a place to live, and you just, as a, as a state, don't have resources to help them, that's a problem. Yeah. Um, but then you have the street people, which are the problem. Mm-hmm. It's not the homeless people, it's the street people yeah. that are the problem. Yeah. And I, I, I'll buy somebody food all day long. Um, I gladly do that. Yeah. Um, saw a lady the other day carrying like six grocery bags. Yeah. 
And I pulled over. I said, man, I know this sounds crazy, but if, if, if you need a ride, I'll give you a ride. And I looked at my wife, and she looked at me. She goes, are you crazy? I said, looks like you're going, and you, know, you, know, you carry a lot of groceries. And she started crying. Yeah. She was just snowing. Yeah. And she's telling me, I mean, she, she's only five blocks away, and she's in one of the halfway houses. Yeah. And I, I drove her. I drove her. My wife's like, you're crazy. I'm like, well, what's she going to do? Yeah. She's got six packs of groceries. Yeah. We, you know, we have our mask on, yeah. and it's the right thing to do. It's crazy. I know I shouldn't do that, but. Yeah. Well, one thing I was like, 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 all these, like, homeless people, like, the missions and stuff, like, you have to be out of it for, like, eight to five, right? So, when you make the eight to five, you have to find someone to go every day, right? Go to the library, go to yeah. the yeah, Which is not good, because then they end up in the street. Yeah. Um, there, there's a broken system. Um, and how many millions of dollars have been spent on homeless in Seattle? Like, Someone said to me that the homeless problem, and, and this guy, this guy works for um, Starbucks now. He was um, a cop in, in Seattle. Mm -hmm. He was uh, the public affairs officer for the city. Yeah. And now he's a um, director of um, all of corporate security for, yeah. for Starbucks. Great job. Does a lot of stuff. And he told me that the city does have the money to fix a huge chunk of the homeless problem. It's just the red tape will never do it. And then I, I was like, wow. He goes, Noah and, and uh, Lauren, my wife's cousin, they work for that company that buys the buildings and puts them in. And Noah's like, oh, you know, we, we, we got to fix this problem and, and blah, blah, blah. And I said, no, I said, I'm, I'm all for what you're doing. I said, but why are you not helping these people get off drugs? Yeah. He goes, well, that's kind of concerned. We were trying to get them off the street, you know, the city and blah, blah, blah. You're just villainizing everyone. I said, dude, don't forget, you get paid $150,000 a year to work for a company that profits from having homeless people there. So th th this whole thing, yeah, you know. Exactly. Uh, who, who's taking opportunities here? I mean, if this was a nonprofit, it'd be one thing, but you guys don't get paid well, yeah, uh, which is w which is baffling. Um, we created the problem. I remember the first time I was in San Francisco, I went to like a group of Starbucks event. So I'm the first time the bartender, right? And this guy is walking up and down. This guy, you're like, he has a piggy bag on, right? Now, you know how you were a little kid, you play in the mud and the mud got on you? He looks like, like you hit it. So I have, he has no shirt, no shoes. I, 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 I don't have nothing where he's at. This thing's like, all right. He's walking down, <clears throat> asking people for a dollar. <clears throat> I'm like, I think to myself, dude, you need more than a dollar. <clears throat> you need someone to invest in your little life and make you better, right? I'm like, man, like. <clears throat> I, I have friends that are San, San Francisco cops, and they, um, they, they just like this hard money. Uh, the, city, the city, the city has just done like. There's three cities that destroy themselves: Portland, Seattle, San Francisco. Um, Seattle's starting to clean up some. Uh, you know, with a new election of the city council, look, I'm, I'm, we, we have to fix things. There's some yeah. broken system, um, but removing all the cops and and defunding the police is not the answer. Yeah, because then you, you actually I think you need more money to make things better, right? Yeah, you know, teaching this this escalation, you know, that kind of stuff, you know. San Leandro, California, spent the money de-escalating because right next to Oakland, mm -hmm. they had a lot of racially biased um, stops and mm -hmm. all those things that all that all slowed down. Yeah. Um, because they're doing sensitivity training. They're doing, um, you know, all, all the all, all of the demographic training. Um, they spend a lot of money there. It's expensive. So, no, I just, I, I'm I'm glad I get to travel for work mm -hmm. because it gives me a chance to be away from the gloom and doom of Seattle. Yeah. So, so you got time to get some eat lunch? Yeah, let's grab some lunch. Then I was gonna say, let's go buy your lunch, man. Walking? Yeah. All right. I got to leave my bag here. Yeah. Right. I left my phone in this last time I did a, a talk. I put my phone on the table and I'm across the stage.
Um, so I want to be like, I want to be with ADP and trying to, I want to be like an SHR company. You want to be a big like that. Yeah. Uh, what can you do in the demo? Uh, hoping next week. Yeah. Um, because the student profession is one of the struggle points. It's employee handbooks. Uh, basic rules, um, KPIs, all the stuff that really is important and how to manage the different situations with employees. They're no good at it. Yeah. They're no good at it. And for most of the time, you'll have someone that keeps a client company yeah. and they never establish any of it. And it's happening, HR is not like a sign, but it's like that's how people HR, I actually do know HR, like along, the people just like treat their employees like they want to say, you're about to treat them like who does that right example i use like when i was the army i had a guy i worked for he always was saying man how do you micromanage i'm the micromanage. what do you do for next second micromanage the fuck out of those guys that's funny that's funny yeah that's very true that is very true and then you yeah. have you follow the rules you know a lot of people think oh like all the time people are like oh well i'm in dallas texas so dallas texas is all this person wants to seattle you gotta follow the seattle rules right yeah, yeah. you gotta know it's labor laws right there for the air oh, yeah. When I was in uh, all the Home Depots in Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. oh, my back was on fire. Labor laws in Puerto Rico, completely different. If you work uh, more than more than four hours mm -hmm. nonstop mm -hmm. uh, without taking your lunch, mm -hmm. every hour after your supposed mm -hmm. lunch hour, you get paid double time. Uh -huh. If you work um, four, it was like five days in a row without a day off, you're double time mm -hmm. until you could take your next yeah. two days off and they're treated consecutive. I know Alaska is like overtime after every eight hours, not forty. So if you work eight hours and you work eight, nine hours that first day you get paid overtime that uh, next hour. Yeah, if you don't get your lunch in Puerto Rico, right, you, you get paid double time so you take your lunch. Yeah. And then of course you go back to later time. I mean there's some there, and then California's been just hammering down on uh, yeah. eating on your counter. Oh yeah. Like like they were going through and they would ask employees, how often do you eat lunch? On, uh, oh, yeah, in the workstation. But you're still overtime for the next day. You're still working. Yeah. Even if you're looking on Facebook, you're at your workstation. Yeah, it's, the, it's the one, yeah. They don't get it, right? But I can tell people, too, like, like the government doesn't have enough people that come audit you every single day, right? I mean, eventually, yes. But what's going to happen, 99% of the time, your employees drop their down lunch, right? Like, example, mm -hmm. you might have a person working for you, a secretary, taking the desk, works at the desk every day. Oh, no problem. But as soon as you tell them for a raise promotion, Ding, 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 ding. They're from the department of labor somewhere else. Oh, yeah, and yeah, yeah, it happens. And they're going to take that first award of yours, right? Yeah, when I was when I was in, in, in especially in big box retail, that there was just every day there was a new, like, are we really dealing with this? Yeah, it's just prevalent. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I appreciate you. Excellent.